All right, so this is BrainNet. Um, this paper came out in 2019. Uh, it's from uh, the University of Washington. Uh, this guy is really cool. He also does like Indus Valley, uh, like script computational linguistic, like computational linguistics research. Um, so his lab does a lot of cool stuff. Um, but this paper in general, I think, got a lot of press because uh, like when you first look at it, it sounds really cool, right? Like it's, it's like basically connecting human brains to each other, right? Like the idea, and I think the wide, most widely publicized kind of picture or graphic from it is this one where we have this sender one, right? This person with, um, with a headset, right? This, this VCI, and then we have a sender two, and then we have a bi-directional link between them uh, that allows them to, uh, to like combine their information. Uh, yeah, and then this receiver actually ends up receiving this information from both these senders. Uh, and then they use their own, like there's another EEG on them that allows them to receive that information and whatnot. So it seems super cool and it is super cool. It's pretty cool. Um, but when we actually get really deep into the paper, you'll realize that it is kind of gimmicky. Uh, like it, it didn't really add anything new to the research. It more just put together things in a really cool kind of way, like things that have already existed in the research literature for a while. Um, it put together, it put them together in like a pretty smart way that allows you to do these, uh, these cool applications, like, like, all, like basically synthetic telepathy, right? Where you're putting ideas from your brain into another person's brain. Um, so yeah, so let's just talk about some of these like, uh, these like uh, like keywords, I guess, EEG, TMS, right? So um, EEG, electroencephalography, um, this basically just means like brain signals that we record non-invasively from the brain. So if you, uh, you can annotate, right? So like on your head or like on your inside of your brain, right? Um, this should be pretty familiar for anyone who came to the curriculum last quarter, right? You have all of these neurons, right? And each of these neurons send these electrical signals. Uh, but that's not what we're measuring with EEG. Um, all of these neurons together, right? These like millions of neurons, um, they like combine together um, their electromagnetic fields and they actually generate these waves that we can measure. So at different parts of the brain, we can like measure like different waveforms that um, come out of your uh, come out of your head. Um, and we call this like measurement an EEG or an electroencephalogram. Uh, and usually what happens is that we place a bunch of electrodes on a person's head at different locations, like non-invasively again, and then we record the EEG signals at various parts of their brain. Um, so yeah, it's basically just brain waves, right? And uh, we can do a lot of kind of algorithms to determine what is sort of going on inside of their head. Uh, but actually it turns out that you can't really decode everything they're thinking from just this EEG signal. All you can really tell usually is just uh, from their overall EEG signal, it's usually just like whether they're paying attention, whether they're angry, whether they're having like a stroke, um, pretty, pretty like um, coarse grain kind of information. But there is something called uh, I need to, I find it. There is something called, did they not talk about it in the, um, they're called SSVEPs or uh, also known as, yeah, SSVEPs. So an SSVEP is called, a, it, it stands for steady state visually evoked potential. Um, it's another kind of way we can read EEG data so the usual way is to interpret it as like brain waves, I guess, right? And we sort of think of uh, different parts of the wave as being, uh, as like correlating to different rhythms. Um, and then when we combine them together, we can like do a Fourier transform and extract these signals. Uh, and then we can say like, oh, look at the amplitude on, on signal alpha. Uh, that means that they must be like very calm or something like that. Um, but there's another way to analyze these EEG signals, which is uh, to use these SSVEPs. 
Um, there's a broader term for these as well. Uh, they are called um, event-related potentials, ERPs. Uh, basically, what that means is that when, when a specific thing happens in your brain, uh, and these are like very highly specific things, not everything has an SSVEP, sorry, not everything has an ERP. Um, certain things, like for example, when you see a light at a certain frequency, right? Let's say this is a red light um, and it's blinking at a certain frequency. Uh, inside of your brain, uh, like this comes through your eyes, right? And then it, it goes to your ocular cortex, which is somewhere in the back of your brain, right? Uh, and then we can measure these uh, SSVEPs, which, are, which turn out to actually be these waves that are correlated with the frequency of the, of the blinking of the light. Um, so if this light blinks like really fast, like really fast, then we see a fast signal over here. Otherwise, like, like if it's fast, right, then we see a fast signal over here. Um, and otherwise we see like a slower signal. Uh, but these are correlated with very specific kinds of things. Like for example, uh, there isn't an ERP for like seeing a cat, for example. Um, there's no signal that we'd be able to pull out of the ocular cortex and say, oh, this means that they looked at a cat. Uh, it's only certain things like they're looking at a light flashing at this rate that we can pull out uh, ERPs for. Um, let's, take, let's take a look at the, uh, at the Wikipedia page for SSVEX real quick. Uh, that's, okay, that's not that helpful. Um, evoke potential could also be, yeah, all right. Okay, so this is, I guess there is kind of a differentiation here. So evoke potentials are different from ERPs, though they're sometimes used anonymously. ERPs have a higher latency apparently. Um, even I did not know this, uh, but basically they're the same kind of idea that uh, certain stimuli produce certain signals in the brain, but of course it's like restricted to certain kind of, uh, certain kind of uh, stimuli. So like, for example, a light flash, right? Uh, mm, yeah, I think a light flash is, is like the most common uh, kind of example of this. And that's what like a steady state evoke potential is. Uh, we can basically, yeah, for example, the properties of high frequency flicker SSEP corresponds to the properties of the subsequently discovered magnocellular neurons in the retina of the macaque monkey, um, right? So, and when it's medium frequency, then, then, we, then it corresponds to like certain other neurons that, that uh, fire at that frequency as well. Um, so yeah, that's the idea with SSVEPs. We don't need to go like too in depth on that, but this Wikipedia page is probably, uh, has a lot more inter interesting information if you want more info about that. Um, so SSVEPs are the other important thing. EEG is important. Oh, and I guess the other important thing is going to be uh, TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, you can look at the Wikipedia page for that as well. That's basically, That's basically putting, like we get to affect the brain, right? We can cause certain neurons in the brain to fire in certain ways by imposing a magnetic field onto the brain. So um, it's completely non-invasive again, right? We have this like, uh, this like TMS wand almost, and then we can uh, run it over certain parts of the brain uh, and, and like change the, uh, change the strength of it and whatnot to cause certain uh, broad, like certain coarse grained kinds of uh, effects. So TMS, I think it basically just like turns off a portion of the brain at a, at a time. That's like the way it is generally considered to work. Um, it literally just turns it, turns off a, a part of the brain. Uh, yeah, it has a lot of like cool uh, abilities. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it has, it has a lot of, um, potential medical implications as well, but basically what, 
what we can do with TMS is that we can like cause people to see certain things. Like obviously we can't, can't cause them to see a cat or something, but we can like cause them to see, like have flickers in their vision and, and stuff like that. Um, and that's basically what uh, this paper uses. It, it uses the TMS to deliver information non-invasively. Of course, in the abstract, I saw like a meme about this recently as well, where like in the abstract, it's like, we're delivering information non-invasively to the brain. And then like you actually read the paper uh, and like the, what it actually does is uh, like it, like the TMS flickers, like the TMS causes a flicker, um, like it causes a flicker if, if it, if the option is A or it doesn't cause it if the option is B, something like really coarse grain like that. Um, we'll, we'll see it when we get to it, but it's not as a uh, hype as it might seem, but yeah, we'll, okay, let's, let's just start this. Any other questions on any of these kinds of background, uh, on any of this background context before we actually like get started with, uh, like diving all the way into this paper, anything about, the... oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, from what I understand, so within this paper, they use the like a TMS to basically invoke like a binary response in the brain. So it's only limited to that. So it's either always like a yes or no. Yeah, yeah, pretty, okay. I, I believe so. I mean, we'll we'll get to it when we do. I right. I read this paper like when it came out a long time ago. So, okay. but it's something like that. It's very co coarse grained. It's not mm -hmm. like they are putting in like like complex ideas into someone's brain. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Any other questions? So the SS EVP or whatever that is, is that's also EEG based, right? Like yeah. Uh, okay, okay. So what what did you contrast that with? Um, um ERP. So, yeah, there isn't I'm not sure if there's a term for like the general kind of EEG analysis. Um, but like what you usually do is you look at an EEG uh, and then you break it down into bands, right? You use a Fourier transform to break it uh, into like various bands, right? Like the zero to four hertz, four to seven hertz, eight to 12 hertz, and so on. Um, and each of these bands, especially when they're from certain brain regions, like I, I, I forget, like I think the theta when it's coming from the temporal lobe means something about like memory formation, something like that. Um, and then when you can, when you correlate those uh, based on the frequency that you're receiving, the amplitude of that frequency, right? Like a really strong theta wave or something and like where it's coming from, uh, then you can make guesses as to like what the brain is doing um, or what state the brain, brain is in. Um, but like event related potentials or like uh, evoked potentials are like very specific to specific types of stimuli. So like when you see a, a flashing light, um, that's going to cause a certain type of SSVEP, um, and so on. There's there's other stimuli stimuli that cause these kinds of things as well. Um, got it, got it. But but a visual stimuli would also um, affect this wh whatever we are seeing on screen, right? Like the EEG bands would also get affected by those signals. Is is that? Oh right? yeah, yeah, totally. It's just a okay. matter of analysis, right? We're we're still gonna if we want, we can still analyze. Like we can show someone a flickering red light and like, and uh, we can analyze their EEG bands. Um, my understanding is just that it won't be as uh, substantive. Like, like, like we won't derive the same information from analyzing their EEG bands as we would by just like literally looking at the EEG and scanning for those event related potentials. Um, but the information is all still there. It's just a matter of how you analyze it. Yeah, yeah, I guess like uh, from the um, event-related potential, the information would be like more condensed, like more specific. It's mm -hmm. probably easier for analysis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. cool. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, I think let's dive into this then. Uh, so yeah, 15 minutes, I think now we're gonna spend, yeah, 15 minutes will be about done by like 35-ish, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, let's, let's start reading through this. 
Uh, we present BrainNet, which to our knowledge is the first multi-person non-invasive direct BBI, like brain-to-brain -brain interface for collaborative problem solving. Um, mm -hmm. Right, they use EEG and TMS to deliver information, right? EEG basically to read information, TMS to deliver information uh, for brain-brain communication. So two of the three subjects are senders, right? Uh, who we like read from EEG and then they're playing a Tetris game together. Uh, and then the receiver who cannot see the game screen, right? So the senders are the ones who like see the Tetris game screen and then they have to make decisions about it. Um, and then the receiver receives that uh, receives that information via this TMS stimulation of the occipital cortex. Um, the occipital cortex is that like ocular um, part in the back of your brain, which like deals with uh, visual processing. So we'll see they like cause like certain things to flicker in the receiver's view that tells them whether to like flip the Tetris block or, or not flick it, flip it. Um, so yeah, the receiver has to integrate the information from the two senders. And then they, oh yeah, okay. Then they use an EG interface to actually like whether whether they should turn the block or keep it in the same place. So here's where that binary thing comes comes in, right? Um, it's just a matter of whether they should turn the block or keep it in the same orientation. Um, <coughs> um, and then they have like a second round. I don't think that part is too relevant. Um, yeah, true, false, positive rates of subjects decisions. Um, and an average accuracy of 81%. So it's still like pretty respectable, right? It's, it's like a binary classification with an average accuracy of 81.25%. Um, pretty solid results, right? And when you're thinking about it, like sure it is just binary classification, but the receiver never even sees the, sees the Tetris screen, right? Yet they're able to make uh, they're able to make the right move 81% of the time, which is pretty amazing. Um, furthermore, by varying the information reliability of the senders by injecting noise, we investigate how the receiver learns to integrate noisy signals. Um, yeah, so this is also like a cool kind of sociology kind of implication that they find there, uh, that the receiver starts trusting the sender who results in, in more correct information. Uh, and then obviously this like a cool transhumanist outlook, right? Like a world in which people can communicate to each other entirely just via brain to brain interfaces. Rather, like obviously it won't just be with binary classification, but a world where um, you can like put your words in other people's heads, uh, which is kind of dystopian as well, but it, I think it's an interesting kind of outlook. Um, so yeah, this is sort of just repeating everything we talked about, right? The EEG and TMS, uh, right? They can, they can, previously they've done something like 20 questions. I'm sure we can look at that paper in the future if you guys are interested, um, because that's more like language oriented, right? Uh, yeah, BBIs lack several features of real world communication. Um, the interface required physical action in the past, right? But now they want to do it with with just EEG, right? The even the receiver is just controlling everything with EEG. Um, yeah. So they also talk about how they want it to be more of a social aspect, right? Like co collaborative problem solving. So the receiver has to basically integrate these independent decisions and decide on a course of action themselves. Um, and we'll see. We'll see later on, I believe. But I believe that the receivers are both presented with the exact same information. Um, it's just that uh, there should be like two sources of information. Like they just add this aspect so that it, there is like a collaborative aspect that allows them to look at possible so societal implications, I guess. Um, and then they have the second round where uh, the receiver in the first round can be perceived by the senders. So yeah, the, there's the, the senders get to uh, correct the receiver in, in this second round. Um, so they actually do it with five groups, right? It's not like an insanely huge uh, population size like you, you often have with some like psychology papers um, because there has to be obviously this hardware setup that they do for each of these things. So um, it's still a pretty, pretty healthy kind of number of uh, users. Uh, I think Chris has a question. 
Yeah, I had a question about like the how it's binary classification. Like, is it because when I when I thought it was Tetris, I thought like it would be okay, move the block clockwise or move it counterclockwise, um, and that would be like a I guess like four. There'd be like four different orientations of it. Yeah. So like, how does the binary, is it, is it like rotate or don't rotate? Is that where the binary comes in? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's exactly Tetris. It's like a Tetris-like okay. game, whether like okay. whether to rotate the block or not. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So it, it's, it is rotate versus non-rotate. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's take a look at the, um, this diagram. I think this will kind of clarify it. I mean, we've sort of repeated the same idea a bunch of times so far, but this diagram is pretty obvious, um, like it's pretty clear over here, right? So uh, we have sender one, right? They're viewing this screen, right? With the Tetris game on it, um, sender two, right? And then uh, each of these people have to think like whether to turn it or not. Um, and we'll see how they actually cause these people to send these decisions. That's where the SSVEPs come up. Um, they use SSVEPs to allow, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll get there. All right, so um, basically these senders have to look at the screen. They have to somehow uh, transmit into EEG whether to rotate the block or not. Um, each of those go through this brain computer interface, right? Like it reads, we read the SSVEPs, like the EEG signal from them. Then we uh, combine this signal uh, and then output it somehow into this TMS. Uh, that then causes the uh, the actual receiver to make the decision to rotate or not. Um, and then in the second round, this is where they have the backflow, right? And uh, the, the, the senders get to view the receiver's decisions and send corrections. Um, right, this is what the, uh, the correction kind of thing is, but I don't think we'll go too, too much into that. So, yeah, again, like with the sociology kind of thing, like which source do you pay attention to, um, who is more reliable, and so on. So they have these results, right? 16 trials. Um, blah, 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 right? They're just repeating the same thing again. Who can see the screen? Yeah, yeah, this, the senders can see the screen in its entirety. So it's both of the, both of the senders see the, see the same screen, or like two copies of the same screen, I guess. Um, rotate or not. Uh, all members of the triad communicate their decisions through an EG based interface using the steady state visual evoke potentials, right? So this is where um, this is like, honestly, these two sentences are what explain like a, a huge portion of this. So um, over here, they say like SSFEPs, right? So we'll basically see that um, the, the senders basically have to uh, look at a certain LED where do they, where do they uh, describe that? Did we, uh... yeah, okay, here. Um, so in the test, I've just focused their attention on a 17 Hertz flashing LED to indicate a rotate decision and 15 Hertz to indicate a non-rotate decision. So uh, this is how the SSVEP happens, right? So uh, when the 17 Hertz flashing LED comes, then we should expect a, an SSVEP with a, with a corresponding 17 Hertz uh, frequency. Um, whereas with the do not rotate, then we should look for a SSVEP for fi of 15 Hertz. Um, and depending on the frequency of the SSVEP, uh, then we can, then this, this uh, BCI over here basically says, uh, okay, it was 17 Hertz. That means this person said to rotate. Um, and then they pass a rotate signal onto here. Let's say this person also passed a rotate signal onto here. Then what happens? Then the sender's decisions are delivered to the re receiver through two TMS pulses de delivered sequentially to the occipital cortex, eliciting a phosphine for a yes decision or a no phosphine for a no rotation decision for each sender. So basically, they're saying um, if both of the if both of the senders look at the 17 hertz LED, um, if both of the senders look at the 17 hertz LED, let me annotate right. Uh, so they have these two LEDs. Let's say this is 15, this is 17. Let's say the sender, uh, they see the block and they're like, okay, you should rotate. Then they look at the 17 Hertz LED. 
um, now this SSVEP comes out of their brain at 17 Hertz. Uh, we can read that via EEG. We process it in this BCI kind of like rudimentary signal analysis thing. And then we say, okay, 17 analysis, sorry, 17 equals uh, like, yes, rotate, right? Um, and then we send a yes decision over here. We send the yes decision over here as well. And then this says, okay, uh, yes, yes. Uh, that means that the TMS should administer two uh, pulses, right? Two phosphine pulses. So inside of this person's field of view, right? They're like, they're, they're just like looking into the distance, right? Whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, if they, if they have, if there's two yeses, then they're going to see a phosphine pulse, like randomly, like somewhere in their vision. Um, and so that's, this is for the first sender, right? Like sender one. And then for the sender two, they're going to see another phosphine pulse because both of the senders, uh, both of the senders said yes to, yes to, to rotate. Um, and then based off of that, uh, now this, this receiver also has to look at either the five or the seven, right? Um, and they say, okay, both of the senders said seven, therefore I'm going to look at the 17 Hertz LED. Uh, and then we detect via this that they said yes, right? Uh, and then we use that move for the game. So that's sort of the overall setup now. Um, you can see how, like, I hate to be mean because, like, I think I think Rajesh Rao has like a really cool lab, and this is this is definitely like cool stuff. But like, you can see how with research, often they will like bury the details. So like, when you're reading through it, it seems really cool. But like, unless you like read into, uh, like this part down here, right, where we finally saw like how how they're actually doing the SS maps, right? Where it's just like, do they look at like a 15 hertz or 17 hertz LED? Unless you read like really deep into like into like find these results um, or this procedure, uh, you don't even realize like how they're doing this. Um, but yeah, I think I think this is sort of the core idea. Uh, I can sort of go through this again, or like, how about there are any questions first, and then we will have like a mini. Uh, Okay, yeah, any, any, any questions first? Yeah, like, uh, can, you, can you explain what you think, um, like, that they were not being uh, straightforward about? Like, what do you think they should have done instead? I think the fact that they put, um, they put the 17 Hertz, uh, 15 Hertz LED thing all the way down, like in overall performance in, in like, as like a subsection of results. Like, I think this should 100% be, oh wait, do, oh, is the methods section in this paper afterwards? Oh, okay, so the methods here is afterwards. All right, that's fair then. I thought, I thought the methods were beforehand, um, but it does just seem sort of buried. They don't, they don't talk about this for a while, right? I think, a pretty core piece of their um, BCI is whether the person is looking at a 17 hertz or 15 hertz flashing LED. Um, and they just don't mention it until very late. I think having in this like sentence in like the introduction somewhere, uh, like in the SSVEP sentence, where is the SSVEP? Or they actually even have that in the, do they have that? Okay, I think one sentence in the abstract about uh, like using SSVEPs and using an LED to uh, stimulate those uh, those event related potentials. I think that would that would make it seem more uh, more kind of fair. But like, I mean, this isn't to take away from the the success of this like this paper. I think it it's a very powerful like it shows like what could be possible. Um, even though we might not have the technology to do the crazy kinds of like putting language inside of another person's head right now, um, it's still, it's still very, like, it's kind of crazy the kinds of transhumanist things we can do. Um, yeah. Yeah. The TMS part is pretty new to me. I wasn't aware of this technology, like existing. It's pretty good. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's it's um it's very short term and like we were seeing on the Wikipedia page, sometimes there are like side effects and stuff, but usually it's fine. You can only really instigate phosphines with it though. Um, like I'm not sure. Yeah, I didn't explain that as well, right? But like phosphines, they usually in your okay, these are like weird trippy ones, but uh, in your field of view. This is well, like, the floating things that sometimes come no, up. No, so they're not floaters. They're actually slightly different from that. Um, oh, when, when you get punched in the face, right? Or like, like, um, or when you stand up really quickly um, and you have those like blinking stars, right? Like the stars in like cartoons, um, those are those are technically phosphines. Um, yeah. So it happens when a part of your brain like uh, gets deprived of, of blood or, or something like that. I, I, and like TMS does it by like shutting off certain neurons. And since you're doing that in the occipital cortex, um, that results in, in phosphines. Yeah, any other questions on, on this? Then we can like just quickly skim through the results and, and that other stuff as well, like all their cool graphs. Okay, um, all right, pop quiz. Uh, so if, if the uh, person, if person number two, looked at the 15 Hertz uh, LED instead of the seven, 17 Hertz LED, um, what would the phosphines look like over here? Like what, what would we expect the uh, receiver to actually see? I can, I can just barely hear you. Oh, sorry. Um... Uh, so would you just see like the phosphine in one and like uh, it would shut off for the second one or yeah I don't know. okay yeah, yeah exactly so um it's it's like one phosphine like it, it's a se it's a sequence of two phosphines mm -hmm. like a sequence of two time windows right? um for the if, if the first person says uh, yes um then we see a phosphine. If the second person says no, then we just don't see a phosphine. So that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so it'll just be like one phosphine burst. I'm not sure how they actually distinguish between whether the first person had a phosphine and the second didn't, or the first didn't, or the and the second did. Like I'm not Is sure. There like some sort of time delay between uh, sender one and sender two to differentiate, or yeah, but they would have to tell you when the time starts, right? Or like when. Oh, okay. The that involves some bias. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, we'll we'll see. Like maybe they'll explain okay. that later, but I don't want to spend too much more time. We should get into like a broader discussion about this. We can look at some of the results, right? So, Wait, this actually, is what the... one other question: like, yeah, what ahead. is the primary reason for having two senders? Is it just for like reliability, or is there a deeper reason to that? I think the main reason is they wanted to test out like the sociological kinds of aspects of this, right? Like if you have one sender that's reliable and one sender that isn't, um, can you like learn to trust one sender uh, over the other just based on like this very sparse kind of evidence? Um, and then I think they like draw it out in this, the discussion and like talk about future implications, future implications for like trust via, via like BCIs and whatnot. Okay, okay. So it's not like two uh, yes signals mean that like um, you rotate it twice or something like that. It's not. No, no, no. It, it, it's just like two sources of information and uh, the receiver then has to make like their best judgment. Oh, okay. Cool, yeah. So this is just like a figure of what the uh, the receipt, the senders actually saw, um, right? So either they should rotate this block or not. And you can see how it's like sort of like Tetris. Here you would not want to rotate it, right? Um, wait. I'm not sure if this is two, wait, let's, receiver and senders across two rounds. Oh, okay, so the receiver sees the, the three example screens on the left, right? Because the receiver doesn't know um, whether to, like it, they don't see the bottom part, they only see the, the, the block um, because they don't know whether it might be like, uh, like they don't know whether it might be like this. The receiver doesn't know that, but the sender can see this and they, and they can see, okay, we, we should keep it unrotated because this will like clear out the entire line. Um, yeah, so the left is this 
is what the sender is what the receivers see. The right is what the senders see. Um, this is where the decision is made, I guess. Uh, must not see the bottom line. Uh, it's a decision in this case, rotate. Okay, I'm a bit confused here because in this first screen, they're shown upwards and then in this screen, they're shown downwards. And then they say the action is to rotate it. Uh, so I'm not sure why it rotates from this screen to this screen, but the correct action was to keep it upwards, right? So, uh, oh, wow. So they actually yeah. get, so they can actually issue multiple actions per round then. Okay. So it's not like, it's just like one, one action per entire block. Uh, they, it's almost like live. So I'm not sure what the time delay is on this, but okay. They're playing it almost in real time. Obviously it's slowed down a, a bit. It's not like super fast Tetris um, or anything, I, I would assume, but they can make multiple uh, rotate decisions per uh, round. Yeah, okay. Um, so overall performance, right? So chance accuracy, if they were just guessing rotate or not rotate, that would be at 0.5. But even with all the different uh, triads, right? The different groups of people, they had pretty awesome accuracy. Um, right? Like definitely above just chance. Uh, the mean performance in the participants in the SSF tasks. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, this is actually where the actual SSFAB stuff was that, yeah, this is where they discussed that. Um, and then the rotate signal, uh, let's see what the caption is on this. Oh yeah, power spectra of the EEG signal across subjects during the SSFAB task. Um, so I guess when they wanted to send a rotate signal, the power, the power spectrum clearly shows that, oh, the power spectrum for 17 Hertz is like super high, right? Um, like the amplitude, yeah, the power uh, is clearly higher than the, the, than, the power, than the power signal for 15 Hertz. Um, and the way you do this is also with like a Fourier transform, I believe. Uh, I'm not sure where they do this, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, but you can basically extract the 17 Hertz and 15 Hertz components from a signal uh, via that kind of signal processing. Um, and then you can see when they wanted to send the do not rotate signal, um, the blue, like the 15 Hertz is elevated above the 17. Then they do some more st stats, right? Like AUC, ROC kinds of stuff, false positive rates, right? Um, if you taken like a machine learning or stats or data science class, um, you'll learn more about this. Honestly, even my intuition on interpreting ROC, AOC is like not amazing, but uh, yeah, you can like read up on that and familiarize yourself. They do some um, like information theory kinds of uh, stuff over here, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I, uh, yeah, we like if, if we want, if you want, you can like come through here and like try to understand these. I don't think it's that hard, right? It's just like the ratio between, it's some like information theory ratio or it might be like some kind of Bayesian uh, kind of product. Uh, good sender, bad sender. This is when they like prefer to trust one sender over another. Uh, they talk about a bit about the sender reliability, uh, more sort of, information theory stuff over here, I think, um, about when to trust a good sender versus bad sender. Um, and this is sort of the reason I think, uh, Shiva, why they were including that, like the two people, so they could they could do all of these kinds of um, results. Uh, discussion, yeah, I mean, we've already mostly talked about most of these kinds of stuff. And then methods, we can skip over. Uh, yeah, I think that's basically it, guys. Um, yeah, if you wanna go and replicate this, then you can uh, get the data. Yeah, that's pretty much it for this paper. I think it's I think it's overall really cool. Um, again, this diagram, in my opinion, where is it? This diagram sort of captures the whole idea, um, but of course it does exclude the SSVEP kind of stuff, which I think is also pretty important. 
Um, yeah. Uh, do they do they go into any depth on how the like 17 hertz is converted to like electrical signals? Like, let's say the sender one is focusing on 17 hertz. Mm -hmm. um, do they go into the decode mechanism for that at all? Um, it's sort of like that's more like background information as well. Um, like it's it's basically power spectrum analysis. Basically, when you have a mixed signal um, of various frequencies, you can generate a power spectrum for it, and uh, that shows you like the amplitude of any the amplitude of any frequency the amplitude of every frequency in that signal. So like, uh, it'll show you uh, the 17 hertz signal has like a very high amplitude or the 15 hertz signal has a very high amplitude. And, and that's sort of what those diagrams we're talking about. Um, but it's sort of just like a standard procedure in EEG analysis. Yeah, cool. Any other final questions? Then we can sort of have an open discussion. Um, uh, about broader implications and stuff. Cool. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, what do you guys think about this paper? I mean, what are your, any strong opinions on whether its results were like good or notable or mean anything? Or on the other hand, maybe they're just like gimmicky kinds of, uh, Trying to get like press headlines. What do you guys think? Um, I mean, I don't know if it's gimmicky, but I mean, also at the same time, I haven't really read any more papers. But you said that this, like, they weren't really building up on, like, it wasn't anything new. It was just like they just packaged it into like a. Um, nice little interface, interface, and like just another way to um, test SSVEPs and like decode signals and whatnot. Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Implementation, right? Yeah, yeah. I think even even that though can be like pretty powerful. Like, I would imagine um, for computers or something. Okay, maybe this is like a bad example, but like. Yeah, I mean, like the von Neumann machine or, or like where like you basically already have the ideas for like transistors and, and all of that stuff. Um, and then he basically packages it into like an architecture that's like really effective of, at what it's do, at what it's able to do right with like the CPU and, and like RAM. And that's sort of like the same kind of architecture that we use to this day. Um, was he adding anything? Like it seems looking back, definitely he did, right? Like computer architecture is a huge component um, of computers. Uh, but I think, again, the question is like whether like this is truly what, like this is truly the same structure that future BCIs will follow um, or it's just sort of a domain specific uh, use case or like, like an architecture for this just, for this domain specific use case. I guess it's fair. Um, uh, like compared to, I guess, compared to other papers that you like have read, how do you think their like accuracy compares for what they tested? Um, like 81.25 and they had an AUC of 0 0.83. Like those are like pretty solid accuracy numbers. There haven't been any other papers doing the exact same thing as them though. So like you can't really compare um, okay. really any kind of like researchers set up their own kind of experiments, right? Like they can, they can set it up such that the accuracy is really low or they could set it up such that the accuracy is really high. I don't think you can really compare apples to apples, but I will say that like for this being basically the first paper to do this collaborative, like non-invasive brain, brain computer interfacing, um, or like brain to brain interfacing, I think 81% is definitely like a respectable number. Um, yeah, even if, even if it is just binary classification and it is just like taking advantage of like SSVEPs, uh, which are relatively like information sparse and like just using LEDs and, and all, all like the sort of flaws per se, they're not flaws, but um, 
limitations per se yeah limitations right like you can only really do binary classification mm -hmm. with this but i mean even our project last quarter that like won first in the u.s for neurotech sc right even that was just binary classification yeah. but i think it's always a good kind of starting point like can you classify between two things in some domain space i think that's always going to be sort of the baseline for anything for any yeah. for any real kind of research in that space that's fair yeah yeah definitely um what do you guys think about like future implications of this technology like transhumanistically like do you think in its current form it could be used for like interpersonal like telepathy or whatever something like that do you think that's possible uh i mean oh go ahead that's you. Oh, i saw you i mean i was gonna say i mean yeah there's always like a concern but i mean there's like multiple applications and just it mm -hmm. comes to like the engineering part of it i mean there you can do it but then someone's gonna have to make it like user friendly and whatnot right yeah yeah, yeah totally that's what I was gonna say. That's it. What do you think? Chris? I was gonna add on. Maybe if they made it like four classes. Um, I don't know. Did they go over why they chose fifteen and seventeen hertz? Like if they were to add like a, a nineteen hertz LED, like a twenty, I don't know, twenty three hertz LED. Now you have four possible um, orientations. So you can make it like a keyboard or something. You know, like I'm trying to think of future applications. How you can communicate? Obviously, you can't get like whole words when it's just um, you barely have any indicators. So there actually is um, an SSVEP keyboard. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, yeah, this thing. So basically they have uh, wait, 36 selected characters, I guess. Um, and each of, the, each of the characters have a different um what's it called a different like frequency and then they mm -hmm. can use ssvaps to uh predict what character someone is looking at um hmm. and yeah this is actually really like it might be really easy to do as like a future project as well i think we were thinking about it last year um about like a yeah project project. Right. yeah they're Some using eye like gaze detection as well mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think yeah, I think I gaze is also going to be important here, especially when you have like 36 different characters, right? I think that might be important to determine which which uh, which key they're looking at. But yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so I noticed that um, this keyboard was published before um, BrainNet. It's like the only new thing that BrainNet really did was make it like collaborative, right? Yeah, like the brain-to-brain -brain interfacing kind of. Yeah. Thing. Is Sci-Hub down again? All right, rip, whatever. I mean, OK, we have like a few minutes left. Uh, where is it? All right, I'll do this later. Um, uh, yeah, we have a few minutes left. So I mean, I think I just wanted to get like your guys' thoughts on like the format of this. Uh, some of you were like asking questions and, and like whatnot, but some of you seem to be uh, less engaged. Uh, I mean, what do you guys think? Uh, like, is that just a matter of not really having anything to say or is it just like you, uh, like you just didn't understand the content? Like, what do you guys think about the format of this meeting? Like, should we do more background information or something first? Um. I for one, um, I just was trying to get a feel for it. I, I, um, I it, it, everything that was said made sense. I didn't find myself uh, super left behind, despite the fact that I didn't know much about the subject. Okay, so, cool. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, as I think that's our goal, right? Like, I think there's a lot of papers in neurotech that can be kind of like daunting, but as you can see, like this paper, I don't think it was that like challenging, right? Um, yeah. Really well, like laid out and fairly for beginners. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Cool. All right. So I think we'll sort of stick with this format. Does anyone else have thoughts um, on 
Um, will you always um, release the like week's papers right before the meeting or beforehand? Uh, yeah, I think we'll start releasing it a bit more beforehand. It, that was just like this week. I, I decided this paper like yesterday, lol. Okay. Um, but I think it's a it's a good first paper to look at. Yeah, uh, I was going. I think to the format sorry. is pretty good. Like, uh, I guess like it was just like interesting listening to what people had to say about it. You know. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, I was going to suggest kind of the same, like maybe uh, if we can do a little bit of reading beforehand, then like uh, the discussion we have during the meeting would be like more useful. Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay, I'll start sending out, sending it out probably on the Friday before. Um, yeah, I think the Friday before is probably fine or like sometime in the weekend maybe. Um, cool. Does anyone have strong opinions on what you guys want to cover next um, for next week's paper? So like we can stick to brain computer interfaces or we can go into like neuromorphic computing or like biologically plausible um, neural nets, um, like neuro, like therapeutic, therapeutical neurotech, right? Like uh, prosthetics and stuff. Uh, what do you guys think? Down for whatever, but I don't know. Is it like? Yeah, like, I mean, if, if no one has strong opinions, like I can, I can still just choose. But like, if anyone has like an area of neurotech that they that they're like pretty interested in and want to like go over as a group, yeah. we can totally investigate that. I mean, I guess for me it would be like speech related um, or like speech decoding related. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess we're probably are doing a little bit of that in the ML sessions. So. Yeah. I don't know if you want this to be a little more generic, like. Um, yeah, I, I don't yeah. want this to turn into like an auxiliary kind of thing to the project, but I think like definitely yeah, yeah. for one week, we can like look at one of the papers and like bring in people from the ML team to, dis to discuss what we're doing for the project, definitely. Yeah, cool. Any other final thoughts? Um, I think we'll probably do something for biologically plausible neural networks. I've been reading a decent amount of those papers recently. Um, and yeah, they're pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. Thanks for doing this. Cool. Yeah, yeah, this is really enjoyable. Um, I'll send it out earlier this upcoming week so, so you, we can like have a more substantive discussion. Thanks, guys. Thanks, bye. All right, see you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yeah.